I think just for a small business to get started, it's just belief in yourself, belief in your product, and not willing to take no for an answer. Hi, this is Adam Dinkus from Tammy USA. Hi, everyone. This is Ozzy from Lotus Net. This is Eddie Lamb from Upper Baby. And you're listening. And you are in. And you're listening to to the the e-commerce show. Welcome to the Ecom Show, presented by Blue Tusker, the number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e commerce experts where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Math. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Ecom Show. I'm your host, Andrew Math, and today I am here with Adam Dinkus of Tanny. Adam, how are you doing today? You ready for a good show? Um, yeah, I'm excited. How are you doing? Doing good. Thank you so much for joining the show. I'm super excited about this one because your category is very, very interesting to me. So let's uh, let's dive in here. And why don't you take a couple minutes here and tell everyone a little bit about your background, who you are, about your business, and we'll go from there, okay? Okay, sure. Um, I've been a lifelong entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was nine years old, sort of become who I am. And about 2013, I started Tanny. And Tanny is basically an online retailer of luxury basics for men and women. Luxury basics meaning everything from underwear, undershirts, thermals, anything that literally is directly against your skin is the type of thing that we make. Yeah, so we started in 2013. We've been growing ever since. With the years, the products have become more and more relevant. We have a a solid background in terms of uh, an environmental consciousness, which seems to be uh, something that's coming up now. It's been Mm -hmm. part of the story for us since the beginning. What what was the business you started when you were nine? (laughs) Oh, that's (laughs) that's a fun question. Well, basically, my sister had gotten a telephone She was a few years older than me and I was jealous and I wanted to get my own telephone. And my parents said I couldn't get one until I was 13 and I was Mm -hmm. nine. So basically in the back of Boys Life magazine, there was an opportunity to sell stationary, personalized stationary door to door. So what I did is I set myself up and literally went door to door knocking on neighbors uh, and asking them if they wanted personalized stationary. Back then, we we used stationery and personalized stationery was sort of (laughs) an exciting thing. Um, And and I would make the... It wasn't money. I would make points. And then I would save up the points until I was able to get my telephone. And for me, that was a real sign of freedom and uh, an opportunity. I didn't have to wait for someone to tell me uh, that I couldn't have something. If I wanted to have it, I could go get it myself. Um, So I think there were a lot of lessons in that. Uh, you know, it wasn't just about the phone. It was about uh, taking care of myself and paving my own way. Yeah. So I guess I don't have to ask uh, if you consider yourself a bit of a hustler since you obviously worked hard since you were nine, which is impressive. So how did you... I would imagine there's a similar story behind this, but how did you get started with uh, with Danny? Um, I, I had been in another industry and had been successful in that that other industry. And part of my exposure there... It was the beauty industry. Part of my exposure was consumer products. And I took some time off because, again, I wanted to start my own business. At that time, I was working with other people and had partners. In terms of mapping out opportunities, it was really looking at kind of every category. There wasn't a specific category that I wanted to play in or not. It was really what was the best opportunity. And what I was realizing was that over time, I was more and more uncomfortable with the underwear that I was getting. I felt like it was getting cheaper and cheaper. I also felt like it got to the point where the packaging was more expensive than the product inside. And to me, that was baffling. And that that is actually true for some of the major brands. I just thought it, there's got to be a way to make a better product. The The majority of the brands that are out there, for example, use materials that were developed in the 1960s or the 1980s. We use materials that were patented in 2012 and beyond. So if we compare it to other industries in terms of technology, be using a telephone from 1960, we wouldn't be using a telephone from 1985. But now we use our iPhone and that's where we are. And if you think about the the differences in the technology, the same evolution and innovation has taken place in other industries. And we look towards fabrics as the opportunity. 
And there's amazing fabrics that are out there that are literally cutting edge. They're more expensive than other brands, I mean, than other fabrics. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also get branded fabrics. So each thing that we, every fabric that we use is certified that it is everything that we say that it is. So if we say it's biodegradable, we say it's sustainably sourced, it's not just us, Tani, saying it. It's actually the creator of the fibers that's saying it. So, so there's transparency there with our customers. So when you say technology behind something that's you know in the apparel business, that's always, uh, as you had mentioned, very referred to the actual fabric. But that's always incredibly difficult to portray to your your customer base, where because from a naked eye, uh, a t-shirt's a t-shirt, and underwear is underwear. So you have to be able to portray that difference behind it. So how have you been able to kind of market that and and pivot around that? That, that that's a it's a great question, Andrew. And I would say the uh, one of our biggest challenges. Because like you're saying, if you look on a website, which is our primary means of distribution, a black shirt and a black shirt, no matter what they are made of, will look virtually identical simply because they're black and they're the same shape. Yeah. So we do our best in our descriptions to explain why our products are different. Uh, there is a fabric page that helps you to understand. Our primary fabric, for example, is Micromodal Air. Other brands use Modal, other brands use Micromodal, but we use Micromodal Air and we explain why we use it. And the reason we use it is because it's thinner and finer than silk. So our products actually are better for sensitive skin than silk would be. So we try to convey that. And what we've added is customer reviews. And I find that that's a huge part of, of just explaining how we're different because these are customers that are talking about their experience with the product. And, and they tell you why they love it and, and why they continue to buy Tani. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we've done to help further that is put up some uh, unboxing videos where customers will get the product and then just literally open it up and show you what they get and give you their initial reaction. And it's that's where you get that wow. Because once you get a Tani product, you feel it. You're like, wow. I, I 100% understand why this is, you know, more expensive than other brands. There's mm -hmm. no question the you can literally tell from the very first touch, but visually it's challenging and trying to convey that online is also challenging. Yeah. So I assume your product is is more expensive than the packaging. Yes. And we also <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh and <laughs> and if you look at our packaging, actually it's it's all recycled or uh, made to biodegrade faster than, than other uh, types of materials. So we put a lot of effort into the uh, environmental impact of our packaging, but it's, you know, the, the outer package is, a, is an envelope, but our product is packaged in clear plastic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is 100% about the product. I'm not hiding the product behind an image. There's no fancy man or fancy lady that's showing you how sexy you're going to look in it. It's literally, you bought this boxer brief. You can see it from the second you buy it, you slip it open and you've already got your, it's, your experience happens as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So you literally get to the product within seconds of opening it up. So I know sometimes you'll get companies that will refer to themselves as a premium brand when in reality, the product's made very well. It's a very nice product. You know, it is obviously a high quality product, but the pricing is set based on the brand, right? You think like your Cartier's of the world and your um, like Louis yep. Vuitton's and stuff. Do you consider yourself kind of, you know, a, a premium brand or are you just more of like, we just happen to be more expensive because of the stuff that we utilize? Oh, I think that it's a premium brand. Uh, mm -hmm. But instead of relying on an established brand name or uh, perceived heritage uh, <laughs> or, you know, some of the other things that prestigious brands are based on, we're focused entirely on our product. And it's not to say that the other, the other luxury brands that you mentioned aren't focused on their products. Products are amazing. In our category, this is, this is truly a luxury product and it's luxury based on innovation. Mm. So it's not based on brand recognition. You mentioned the differences of other products versus your own, which is, you know, the types of fabrics and things that you do. But what are the benefits of those fabrics that the user gets from using one of the old ones? Because I trust me, I've got my pair of underwear where I'm just like, these things are garbage. So I'm, I'm very curious what your answer is. 
explain to me what the what the question is again. Like the the fabrics that you use that are mm-hmm. so the technology that you've obviously improved upon that's been stuck in the seventies for years. What is the benefit that the user gets from those in, those new fabrics that you're utilizing? Like they last or the more durable, they last longer, they breathe better. Like everything, what? every every single thing that you're saying, they are a they're guaranteed. Like I said earlier to be mm-hmm. exactly what they say. If I say it's sustainable, it's truly sustainably sourced. If it's biodegradable, it truly is biodegradable. Um, and every aspect of it that we develop is designed to do that. But it's designed to make the, the product, A, more comfortable. That is the focus of our, our whole mission is to figure out how to address issues that men have with their underwear and find ways to make it more comfortable. So for example, we did a soft stretch waistband uh, a couple of years back. So we, one of the issues men had was that the waistbands, traditional elastic waistbands were squeezing their bodies around their waist. And in some cases, actually leaving a brand impression on, <laughs> on your waist. I don't know if you remember that and that when you had a, a red stripe mm-hmm. around you, but basically why are we suffering with that? You know, there's ways to make it better. So we developed this soft stretch waistband and it holds the underwear up, but it doesn't squeeze or grip your body. Uh, in a way that makes you more, you know, uncomfortable. In terms of the performance of the fabrics, uh, like you said earlier, they are uh, sustainable, they're biodegradable, they're antibacterial, they're anti-odor, they're highly breathable, they're moisture wicking. They're basically everything that you want. It's just the most advanced version of that. You mentioned earlier that, you know, your your primary um, sales channel is your, is your website. Are you available in brick and mortar retail? Are you on marketplaces at all? Or is it solely available on your website? Primarily available on our website. And it's also available on Amazon. It's not available in traditional retail brick and mortar stores. Is that a direction you're thinking of going in in the future? Or do you like the D2C? You know, I'll, I'll be honest. I tried to go to department stores and retailers at the very beginning because it seemed mm-hmm. like the logical next step. A lot of them, you know, underwear is not a big category for these department stores. It's a bit of a commodity. It's an add-on. It's Mm -hmm. not a highly profitable business for them. And it's not an area where they're interested in investing in new brands. If you go to your local retailer, when was the last time you saw a new brand of underwear in, in you know, in a Macy's? It is literally the same thing that was there 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, So I found that the retailers, the big retailers were not interested in the category, had nothing to do with the, the products. So I went to the next level, which was sort of men's specialty retailers, like where they would do specialty tailoring, where they have nice Italian clothing or, you know, all that, that type of thing. And again, it was just that underwear was, you know, not a, a big seller for them or it wasn't a category that they were interested in getting involved in. And even though it would make sense that if you're selling men's high end suits, you know, two, three thousand dollar suits and luxury socks and, and this, why would yeah. you offer underwear and an undershirt that would go with that? I mean, that's literally what's touching the customer's body. So the argument was, was real. But again, it, it wasn't an area where there was any interest in investing in new brands. And while I was out there trying to, you know, hustle around, and and get the brand into retailers. The website was going. It was sort of automatic. People came back. Once they tried the product, we usually have someone come... Like They'll usually buy one or two, either underwear, undershirts, combination. And they come back usually within 24 days on average and buy more. So huh. a, as this happened, it's sort of the website continued to grow. And I found myself just, you know, no matter what I tried, I was banging myself against the door. I mean, it was just not happening. And at that time, I just, you know, what was going was the website. So we just focused on that rather than trying to convince people that there was a business. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, hopefully they're listening because (laughs) that sounds to me, that sounds ridiculous because I I completely agree. I was in a wedding a couple months ago and went through the whole like, you know, men's warehouse, Jose Bank thing. And like, great, I got to get this and this and Mm -hmm. this. And I'm like, you don't have like a premium anything else like i have all these like you'd think that that would be a nice upsell opportunity like head to toe feel great during that big day and instead exactly just like underneath you're gonna still be gross (laughs) 
Right. Well, you know, I think people try to have at least like one special pair of underwear guys, at least, you know, it's yeah. either date night. We all know that know, pair. <laughs> hook up, hook up night, you know, going out. And this is really like, if you're going to buy one pair from us, this for sure will be your go-to lucky pair. <laughs> and and what, what you'll find basically is it'll be so comfortable that it'll wind up rising to the top of your draw. Uh, yeah. And you'll also find a year later that it still looks great. It's still is in the same shape. It has shape retention. All the performance capabilities are still there and it looks brand new. And I, I would argue most most brands would deteriorate or start to deteriorate after, after a year's worth of wear. Yeah, I w- that was actually my next question because I was curious, like it's biodegradable, which, you know, can sometimes mean it's meant to not last very long. So how long does a pair typically last in comparison to some of your competitors? What oh, compared to our competitors? I mean, we have customers that have products uh, that they write to us and let us know they still wear that could be five years old and they mm-hmm. still look brand new. But we're talking about I me mean, like seven to 10 years it's going to start to break down. And once it starts to break down, it's designed to break down the landfill or yeah. you know, that type of environment. Because of the materials that we use, it will break down faster than other, other fibers, other fabrics. So let's, let, let's go back to the now that the retailers are... We've realized Out of the picture. Idiots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're you're solely on your website. You're also doing Amazon. Which one of those is, is your lead revenue driver right now? The website. The website. Yeah. So that is relatively common in the apparel industry, right? Because it's a little bit around branding and it's so wildly difficult to stand out on Amazon's because that was my next question on the Amazon side is like you said, if you just look at a black t-shirt versus a black t-shirt, which is basically almost all you get when you're browsing mm-hmm. on Amazon, how are you trying to stand out from the extreme amount of competition that you're literally right next to? I think that's, I mean, that's, that's an amazing question. And anyone dealing with Amazon would be curious to hear, you know, (laughs) it's a, it's beyond complex, the Amazon system. It's literally its own ecosystem. And I would argue if you want to play in Amazon, if you're not an expert, you need an expert on staff because there's, there's just no way to, um, to, to figure it out. I mean, it will take years to figure, figure out the system. But basically, even though our products are on there, if you type in our brand, they won't necessarily pop up. And that's similar to Google, where you now have to uh, sort of advertise or compensate Amazon to get yourself to pop up, even if it's just your own brand. Um, But one of the things that Amazon does do is it allows you to set up your own store. So if Mm -hmm. people can find your store, then they can literally buy everything or anything that they want off off of your website. And they buy it through Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it can facilitate that. But I think Amazon is a requirement, even though it's a real difficult player. It's not a, you know, it's it's not easy to work with them, but their prime program is ideal. Everyone goes to Amazon multiple times a week. And if Mm -hmm. they can get a TNE product and know they're going to get it in 24 hours, I think that's very compelling. And even though we ship it within, 24 to 48 hours. We're shipping through the post office and it's going to take a couple of days to get to you. Mm-hmm. It depends on the carrier, et cetera. You know, Amazon has its own distribution network. So when they say it's going to get there in two days, it gets there in two days. So I think that's that's one of the advantages to being on Amazon. So is Amazon kind of like a necessary evil for you? Like basically you're really only on there because you know that some people are searching your brand name and you still want to be available so that people can get it faster? Or are you on there to try to leverage some of that pre-existing traffic and, and still try to get it? Like, are you advertising or anything like that? Oh, absolutely. We're, I mean, in order to get your brand to pop up on Amazon, you have to yeah. advertise in the first place. But yes, we are advertising and, um, and we're finding we're starting to sell a lot of t-shirts. I, one of the questions I had uh, before going into Amazon was yeah, Amazon to me is primarily a lower price environment. Mm-hmm. You know, you're getting yeah, deals. What's cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And so there was a question about whether Tanny would, would be able to move. You know, I'm comparing a $45 pair of underwear to, you know, a five pack that's costing $15. Yeah. There's definitely a difference between the two. But what I'm finding is people are actually willing to try Tanny. So they're both our existing customers and their new customers. And I think there's just that curiosity, like, why? what is the difference? And how different is it? 
and and then they buy it and then they understand exactly what it is. So let's let's pivot back to the to the breadwinner, the website. What's mm-hmm. your what is your marketing strategy? That you have, you know, some people that really cater to just organic social, you have paid advertising, you have an influencer approach, like everyone's always got a little bit of everything, but there's always one that's the main focus. What is what do you guys kind of focus on? I think the most uh, significant driver of traffic is articles about Tani or reviews about Tani by not necessarily influencers, but I, I guess they would be called influencers. I, they were around before influencers. So people that, let's say, specialize in style or they specialize in you know, high-end luxury products or how to make a, you know, live a healthier life. So anyone like that, we've reached out to and send them some samples. And it's really their, their reaction to the product and, and what they think. And that's both in terms of articles that have been written, videos that have been shot for YouTube. It's really that that's the key driver for us. So it's authentic reviews from actual customers. We do do social. Uh, to me, social is a, a, you know, is a requirement, but it's not, uh, it's not really a driver for us. It's more a way just to build relationships with our with our customers and build a sense of community. And and Google Ads, we do do. It's not. I think other brands would say they they spend very heavily on Google Ads, and it's their biggest driver. We we haven't um, we haven't really gone in that direction. Yeah, I always find that apparel on Google Ads is very difficult because you're fighting for those top five six spots, which is usually the cheapest one, or you're just you're limited to copy for the most part, unless of course you're doing display ads. But even then, those are really just more like impressions than actual clicks. Yeah. But what about on like a social advertising side? Or because I would imagine for you guys, social advertising would probably be the way to go in terms of being able to get in front of new customers. Have you tried like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all that fun stuff? Uh, we've tried Instagram and we've tried Facebook. We haven't been successful in the past. What I would say is that there's many reasons that a company will not be successful uh, mm-hmm. in any of these advertising vehicles. Yeah. Uh, it could be the keywords that that are in there that are not truly identifying what your brand is about. So you're you're pretty thinking. catered. <laughs> sorry. So you're pretty catered to almost like I would say like an SEO side slash influencer approach where they're more like higher end influencers of like. People that are, you know, known in the industry, not just like your TikTok guy who's got, you know, standing in his underwear sort of thing. So you're you're going high level influencer and level and basically trying to leverage the, I guess, the existing traffic from their website that then obviously gets driven over to yours. Yeah. And the credibility that they've established with their audience, because yeah. you know, they're not always recommending products, but if they do, it has to be something that they want their name associated with. Mm-hmm. You know, so they're going to try out the product, and you know for sure that they're not going to uh, recommend a product that they don't think is worthwhile because it's just going to cause problems with their audience and it's going to make them distrust them. Yeah, that's true. So it's at the time of this recording, it's February 2022. Big hot topic is supply chain issues. How have you guys been able to, you know, kind of deal with the fact that it's taking forever to get stuff from overseas? That's a great question. So one of our challenges is that the fibers are actually from Europe. So what we do is we have the fibers from Europe sent to China, where we have a manufacturing facility, Mm -hmm. make the fabric and then create the garments. What so there has been delays in getting the fibers from Europe to Asia. Mm -hmm. But what we've done is order extra materials as this has been happening. Which and and we've also started to move to air transportation. So mm-hmm. instead of using uh, you know a ship or a cargo to get our products from Asia, we actually use like DHL and they they fly it overnight. And even though it's a little bit more expensive, the fact that we can keep our shelves stocked and keep product in stock is more important than you know than the the difference in the cost in terms of getting product here. Are you solely flying it or are you doing a mix of like letting some sit on a boat and wait in line or are you just flying everything? Flying everything. Wow. The product, you know, the, mm-hmm. we, we went through, for example, Black Friday was, was the best day that we've ever had in our entire history. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, we're still going through, uh, you know, growth phases. So the, there's some variability in terms of 
uh, what inventory we need to keep and how fast it's actually moving through. So in order to maintain that, we have had to keep all our products in the warehouse in Asia, and then as needed, pull from that inventory and fly it over. Yeah. So we're rather than moving all of our product at one time, we're leaving it there and only pulling as necessary. Smart. I like that. Yeah. It's an I mean, it's, approach. I haven't it, heard that approach before. It's it's worked for us. Um, I think maybe for for much larger brands, you know, that might yeah. not make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're we're in a position where we can do that. So one of the questions I always like asking, it's always interesting to me, is you know, we we always find that that you know, million dollar a year mark, five million, ten million, or kind of those thresholds in the beginning of, of an e-commerce business that everyone always has struggles getting over. But yeah. I know you've surpassed the seven figure side. So what do you think was the your secret sauce that was able to get you over that initial hurdle? I wish I could tell you that there was one secret sauce. I, I think it was a, <laughs> a matter of just believing, truly believing in this product. I think that the most difficult part of starting a business is getting it to that point. Mm-hmm. So getting it from from zero to a million is probably the hardest part of the business because you're starting literally from zero. Once you're at a million, growing from there, um, not that it's, it should be easier, but you at least have the momentum and some wind behind you and some existing revenue coming in. So you're less fearful. You know you can spend the money. You know the opportunity exists. You just then build on it. Um, but I think to get from from one to uh, you know from zero to a million, I think it's just sheer tenacity, belief in yourself, motivation, and and a willingness to make uh, mistakes. I mean, you you really are starting with nothing, so you're going to make mistakes. But I think it's it's you just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's not having zillions of dollars. I mean, you can do it with a lot of money, but I yeah. think just for a small business to get started, it's just. Belief in yourself, belief in your product, and um, not not willing to take no for an answer. It's it's interesting you say that because just this morning this was a topic I was talking to someone about. And mm-hmm. it, when you're when you're running a business, you it, it's those little tiny wins that you have to celebrate to to kind of start to get over that hurdle. And just like you had mentioned, that first zero to a million is complicated and it's tough. And you know once you break it, it's a little bit less of a stress, and you can take some more risks and things like that because you have that existing revenue coming in. What is it that motivates you or that you do in your day to day life to keep yourself motivated if you know you know things don't exactly go the way you want? Like what is it that kind of keeps your drive going in this business? I think that's a great question because there are such especially in smaller businesses ups and downs, and it's a mm-hmm. little bit more of a rocky ship you know you're you're not a big boat yet, you know you're just sort of a little sailboat or something, so there are days that are that you're really down and I guess what motivates me most is the idea that I don't have to work for someone else. That's a huge factor for me. I've done that in the past. I've, I've worked with amazing people, but I want to know that I'm spending all that time that I'm spending is not making someone else really wealthy, but at least I'm putting that time into you know making my life what I want it to be, not someone else's life what they want it to be. And I think that's just an underlying concept or underlying belief in a lot of, you know, business people that start their own businesses. It's just the, it's not even wanting to be a boss. It's just wanting to have some control over my life. And that, that's, I, I consider that freedom. And I think that's my, my core driver. Yeah. And it goes back to the, you know, to being nine years old. It was, it was to have independence. I don't, mm-hmm. you know, I never liked being told what to do. So. Better off I being can, my own boss. <laughs> I can definitely stand by that. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. <laughs> Adam, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Obviously, I really appreciate having you on the show. I would love for you to kind of take a second here, let everyone know where they can find out more about you or about Tani, uh, and then we'll wrap things up. Oh, they can definitely look up me on uh, on LinkedIn. I have a profile. It has lots of information about me and my my past experiences. Uh, and for Tani, it would be Tani, T-A-N-I, USA.com. Uh, and I would recommend that people sign up for the newsletter because we have a lot of deals that we give just to those people on the uh, email list. So uh, it definitely makes it a lot uh, more affordable to to buy the product if you uh, sign up and you you get one of the invites to our sales. Beautiful. Adam, thank you so much for being on the show. Of course, everyone that tuned in, thank you for coming and joining us today. 
Please make sure you rate, re- review, subscribe, all that fun stuff on whatever podcast platform you prefer, YouTube or ecomshow.com. Doesn't matter. Uh, but we will see you all next week. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker a full-service digital marketing company specifically for e-commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of The Ecom Show.